Hello everyone. Welcome to the third session of Learn to Communicate Q&A session with uh, Lauren Lenders. Hello Lauren, thank you for joining us. Hi, you're welcome. Uh, you. Yeah, uh, this is for the third time around for the third week of the month. And uh, we are delighted to have Lauren with us despite her busy schedule in the month of uh, October. Um, so for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, Lauren is um, is a is a wonderful AAC specialist, and uh, she's she's not only a speech pathologist but also an AC and AAC and AT consultant all rolled into one. And uh, she has a lot of resources of uh, AAC that she shares widely on social media. Um, she is also a public speaker and she's a blogger, guest blogger, etc. And uh, she's been associated with AWAS for many years and uh, has been there for a long time, uh, shaping some of the features of AWAS. And um, yeah, so we are delighted to have her today. And uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, um, she, uh, you have a question and answer session for 30 minutes. And uh, if you have any questions, you can write it on the queue icon there on your panel. And uh, we'll try and answer it at the end of the session. Um, yeah, so we can get started with some of the questions. Okay, so the first one is uh, how to use Ava's app for children who do not understand speech or pictures. Okay, um, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's something that actually we all know uh, without knowing that we know it. Um, if you think about the way that you interact with infants, um, you know, very early on, typically developing infants, we don't um, we don't make a decision whether well can they understand me do they do they know this word do they know what this item is before talking to them we just go forth and we talk to them and we we talk to them and we talk to them and we provide all kinds of language models speaking to them never really having an expectation that they're going to respond or without really knowing that they know what we're talking about that they have any understanding yet we continue to model. And we do that often for 18 months to two years, still not necessarily always knowing if they know what we're saying. Um, so the answer here is pretty simple, um, that if you think that your child does not understand speech or pictures, you still want to be providing verbal and providing models with AVAS um, or any kind of AAC that you're using. Um, lots and lots of models talking to them. Uh, if you don't provide those, then it's pretty certain that they're not going to be developing that language. So, um, you know, kind of have, have faith that your models will make a difference and just keep talking to them, uh, modeling to them, uh, interacting with them with language. Um, and, yeah. you know, it, it will come. Um, you know, everybody's got their own schedule and, and you know, it's hard to say when, uh, of course, like, you know, I don't know uh, your kids and, um, but that, that would be my best advice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, it's like talking to a child who's even six months old, how in the same way that they don't really understand pictures or speech, but you still continue talking. So I guess. Right. And same thing. Yeah. Reading books, you sit down with infants and read books and you point to the pictures and you talk about the words and. Um, it's something that we really do quite naturally with kids who are typically developing, but then we're so focused on, on helping and fixing and all those kinds of things when we have a child with a complex communication need that we sometimes yeah. can kind of forget those natural things we do with language learners who um, are younger but are typically developing. And it's really the same principle that you, that you want to apply. Keep talking, keep modeling. Right. Yeah, so that question was from Aruna Kamath. Uh, moving on to the next question from Bhargavi Atre. How do we decide to introduce AAC without knowing the child has communicative intent or not? Right, and that is exactly the same answer as the last. Um, you make the assumption that they do or that it will develop, and the more you model, um, the, the better it's going to be for them. So um, I wouldn't worry or not um, whether, you know, there's there's a lot a lot of these questions and, and, and uh, legitimately I understand those questions. 
A lot of them kind of have to do with how do I know if my child is ready and is understanding. Um, and the thing that we need to operate on is there are no prerequisites. So there, there are no prior skills that are required before you start teaching someone language. Um, and again, we do that naturally with speech and it should be exactly the same. So I would start, uh, even if you're not sure that they understand, I would start um, talking to them, talking to them using uh, the system modeling and I'll try to demonstrate a little bit of that at some point um, here. Um, so, you know, try not to worry so much about whether you know if they have intent or not. Just start talking and exposing to lots of language, both natural speech and with, um, with your AAC system. Right. So the key there is actually the fact that uh, there are no prerequisites for a child beginning starting with AAC. Right. There's, yeah, there's a, a yeah. There's a woman named Pat Miranda in, in the field who's uh, kind of one of the the, the really important folks who um, contributed a lot to the field. And um, she, the thing that she says is the only prerequisite to starting with AAC and implementing AAC is that your uh, as that the individual is breathing. Not mm -hmm. about not That's about physical physical ability. That if your child is breathing, then it's time to start modeling and using um, AAC. Wow, that's an amazing thing to keep in mind. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is, how do you organize AAC for a child who is just starting with AAC? My child, uh, eight-year-old, can read but has apraxia, visual and motor. So the finger usually strikes the nearest picture, but not the one he actually needs to say. How do you handle this? Okay. So um, that's a really interesting question. What was Sorry. that? That was from Indriyani Salfale. Okay, um, so that's a great question. Um, so that's kind of two questions. How do we organize it for a child that's just starting AAC and um, a child with motor apraxia or you know, uh, adult, really anybody with motor apraxia um, is having trouble being accurate. So, you know, they're, they're trying to push one button, but they're hitting the button to the right or the left or above or below. So there's actually, uh, there is uh, an option that if you're using uh, an iPad-based solution or, you know, even a, a other types of solutions that are touch screen, um, if you have an individual who um, is using direct selection, so that means they're touching with their finger, but they're not accurate, you can purchase or make um, something called a key guard. And I wish that I meant to bring one to have, sit, have it sitting right next to me, um, but I don't have one. A key guard is simply a plastic grid um, that overlays on top of the screen uh, and that has holes in it that line up to where the buttons are. Uh, so okay. what happens is you, you can only get to a button because you drop your finger into the little square or a little circle that are on this piece of plastic or whatever it's made out of. Um, and then it makes it a little bit easier because you're dropping your finger kind of into a hole, into a well, rather than just sliding around on the screen. So um, there is a company in the U.S. called KeyGuard AT, all one word, KeyGuard AT. And they produce custom key guards, uh, and key guards are very, very specific. Uh, so what happens is um, you have this little piece of plastic that's a, that's a grid that sits on top of the screen inside the case. But as we know, there are lots of models of iPads, lots of case types. Um, there are many um, different apps, and then then within the app, you might have um, you might have eight pictures, you might have uh, 40 pictures, and that is all very, very specific. So in their in their company website, uh, again, it's KeyGuard AT, you actually go and you fill out a worksheet that says which model iPad and which app and what case the device is in. Um, and with all that information, then they're able to custom create um, a key guard that sits on top. Um, if there are not a lot of buttons on the screen, sometimes you can kind of create them yourself out of something like foam. Uh, um, people have used, they, they stick a screen protector over the screen and they'll use things like puffy paint, paint that sticks up, or they'll use things like wiki sticks, which are kind of these like little wax 
strips. It's, a, it's like a child's toy that stick on top of a screen protector. Um, now, I actually do an entire session on key guards, and I have a handout from that session. So I can, well, if I can send that to you, that just talks all about the kind of key guards and the companies and all that. Um, okay. so yeah, so that's what I would recommend if there's an accuracy challenge. Um, and then the organization, uh, the, the rule for uh, the way to set up any kind of communication system is you want to have the most buttons on the screen that the person using can both see it accurately and use and touch or access accurately, however they're, they're accessing the screen. We have some individuals with some other systems um, that are, are scanning, but this is this is direct selection. This is touching um, So it's you want it with the most buttons um, that they can access accurately um, So a, one of the mistakes I often see is people starting with too few buttons on the screen um, Because the thing to remember with the buttons is that the less the fewer buttons there are so as your buttons get bigger on the screen you have less buttons. That means that you can represent far less language on one screen. So to get to the words you want, you have to do a lot more navigating. The more, the more an individual needs to navigate, the less likely they are to use it because people don't like stuff that's hard. So um, you're always gonna be best having the most buttons that, um, that the individual can accurately use. And it may be that in, in uh, your child's case, that a key guard may be the right solution. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point to keep in mind that uh, to always provide the maximum number of icons per page so that the navigation is reduced. Yes. Okay. Um, now the next question is from, Pankaj Gupta, um, my kid is non-verbal and difficult to engage in any activity. I do not know if she understands what we say to her. How do I start? So I guess this is the same answer that uh, you had given earlier. Yeah, it's but, it's just, you know, and so the modeling, I, I was trying to, you know, I feel a little bit of glare in here. So I think a lot, a lot of folks aren't really sure exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about modeling. So, um, you know, if I was not sure if a child understood me, um, but I'm going to go ahead and model anyway. Uh, what I like to do is we, we I mentioned this in, in previous sessions that when we talk to typically developing children, we just talk to them, we ask them questions. Um, but when we tend to talk to a, a child that has a disability, we have a tendency to want to teach them and to ask them questions and to test them because we're so um, we're so eager to make sure that they're learning what they need to do. Um, but then what happens is using the device it can be perceived as a demand, as a job, as a task. And it's not that's not what the purpose of language is. So if I was going to model, um, I almost always start, if I wanted my child, let's say I really wanted my child to, um, to ask a question. The first thing I would do is I would ask my child tons of questions using the device. So for example, so I, so here we have questions. So I'd be like, hmm, I have a question. Okay, I'm gonna go to questions. I have question. a question. I wanna know when. when should we, let me go back. I'm gonna go back to the main page. When should we stop? When should we stop working? And what you'll see is I also, I did not touch every single word that I spoke. In the beginning, it is completely okay for you to just kind of activate, you know, one or two buttons um, out of the entire sentence. But the rule of thumb, uh, and that, I don't know, that might be an, an American or English expression, the, the rule, the, then of the accepted rule, um, is that if your child, or if, if it's an adult, doesn't matter, um, if, if the individual using AAC, let's say that most of the utterances, most of the things they're saying are single word, then the rule is that you want to model one to two more words than that. So if they are always, you know, they come up and they say ball, book, go, want, then you would model 
um, something like, oh, you, um, you want it. So you're always going to be expanding. So if, if your child comes up with a, you know, a, a, a bag of snacks and kind of just puts it in your, in, you know, in front of you and you know that, that they want you to open it, you wouldn't just open it. You would say, oh, okay, you're, you're handing me the snacks. Um, I think you're saying um, to me, when you push that, when you put that here, I think you're saying yeah. want, and let's see where the word open is. And I'm not really sure where open is. I could search it, but it want, let's see, way. let's find it. O P E N open. Where is that? Oh, let's see. Oh, there it is. Okay. Open. It's a describing word. I had to go to describing words. Want, open. Okay. So, um, you know, if I, it's definitely just model, 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 model. Um, so, you know, the, the, the question, um, and again, it doesn't matter whether you're sure if, if they understand you or not, you just, you talk and model. Um, and I'll try to give a couple more examples of that. Yeah, so the important thing is to model at one word more, one or two words more than what the child's level is. So if the child says biscuit, then you say eat biscuit or eat chips so that you model one word more than what the child does. Okay, that's right. a good thing to keep in mind. Yeah, and we do that naturally with, with typically developing kids. If a, little, if a little baby toddles up and they hand us a ball, we're like, oh, that's a big ball. That's a big blue ball. We do that completely naturally. So it's just, right. a, you know, a matter of uh, reminding ourselves to do exactly the same thing, but also doing those models with the device. Right. Yeah. Okay. The next question is from Shabnam Abrar. Can we get the stages that one should achieve before moving on to each stage of communication? So basically, I think she's trying to ask, how do we know that he's ready for the next stage? And what are those stages? Um, well, again, it's you don't always know if they're ready. Um, so the, the challenge is, is if we're waiting for a, a child to be ready for a particular um, layout or stage. Um, what I see in my in my practice in the schools in, in the United States and I, and I hear from people all over the world is what's happening is that um, there, people are never really sure whether a, a child is ready to, to move on um, and, and kids are getting stuck. Um, so I'm having students that are 21 years old and they are now aging out of the school system. They're, they're graduating because they can't be in school anymore. Um, and they've never been moved forward because nobody has actually modeled the next step. Um, so, um, you know, I would just kind of stick with that, you know, if you're at the one word level, then, um, then be modeling two words, uh, and then also continuing to, to remember that you want as many words on the screen as they can see and accurately touch, um, and then not worry so much about what phase they're in, um, you know, there, there is a, uh, there's a, a family website. Uh, now there's another kind of communication method, which is, is quite different, but it's just another option of AAC called pod. Um, there are many, many options, many apps, many devices, many methods. Um, but one thing that's kind of neat, if you look at, uh, so we speak pod, that there's a mom um, and she has uh, several kids with uh, multiple disabilities who all use AAC. But one of the things I try to recommend to people, so she, uh, she takes videos of her modeling. Now it's a different system, but it, it really doesn't matter that it's different than what you're using. It's the, it's the concepts. But if you, start, if you go on YouTube and watch some of her very old videos, if you go back numerous years and then you, you watch now, what you'll see is um, you'll see this kind of incremental um, improvement in her, her children's and her children uh, may be significantly more um, um, physically and, and uh, perhaps cognitively impaired than many of, of, the, of your children. Um, yet, you know, with, she just kind of went and just modeled, modeled, really not sure, um, but just 
continued, continued. Um, and it is kind of neat to watch some of the very early videos when the children were younger and then now what they're doing now. Um, and it's all because she just continued modeling. Right. Yeah, God has been amazingly successful. Yeah, but I don't I don't want you to, you know, I, I recommend that only to see the, the progression in the children, not suggesting that you should be selecting pod over what you have now. Um, yeah. it's really just the principle. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, the next question is, uh, how do how do you how do I encourage my child to use Avas? Every time my child wants something, he takes me to the place where it's kept, be it sweets or toys. And how should at that time switch to make him use Avas? And also, if he has specific gestures or verbalizations for specific words like water, should I make him ask for water or accept his gesture? Okay, great, great question. So um, my answer is that you will, as long as you think it's um, understandable and you, you know what it is, um, you would accept it. But what you would do is something um, called attributing meaning with the device. So the, your child is using behavioral communication. So they're you know handing you chips because they want you to open it, or they're maybe taking you by the hand to the refrigerator, or you know those kinds of behaviors. Um, and you've learned what those individual behaviors mean, and that's that's great. That's quick. The challenge is is that not everybody your child encounters will necessarily understand their be behavioral communication. So you want to provide your child with the language tool using AAC to ask those same things and lots more than they can do that way. So the way to do that is called attributing meaning. So you would accept it. So let's say your child brings you chips and they hand them to you. What you would do is you would accept it. Oh, you're handing me chips. I think maybe you're telling me I want let's see where would chips be let's go to food and snacks, snacks and um sideways i don't know if they're here but um you can select any whatever just anything so or whatever chips um so what i've done is then i have accepted that look i i am acknowledging that you're communicating to me that I understand. So, oh, you're handing me chips. Okay, but then I am providing the language that would go along with that, that request so that in the future, um, they might know how. Now, you may have to model that five, mm -hmm. 10 times, a thousand times. Every individual is different in how many models. Um, but mm -hmm. my best encouragement is um, just keep modeling. Try not to um, get discouraged and stop modeling. Well, he's not getting it. She's not getting it. She's still doing this. Some, some individuals take tons and tons of models and some take fewer. Um, but every time, oh, you're handing me the chips. I think you're telling me something. You're telling me I, I want chips. Okay, you can have chips. So you are acknowledging, but then you are replacing the behavior with, with showing them how they can do it. But you're not requiring them. This is really important. If they say something that you understand, um, you don't want to then require them to say, okay, now tell me on the talker. Tell me on the talker. You're just modeling. But as soon as you say, okay, now tell me, you're actually asking them to do something twice. People don't like that. Um, so what we see a lot is pushback from individuals because it starts to feel like a job and a demand. And they already said something. I, even kids who have verbalizations, I see people saying, um, you know, so the child comes up and they say bald. And you say, okay, bald, now tell me on the talker. And I say, that's like, asking someone their name and they tell you their name. So I said, you know, oh, hi, what's your name? And Lalitha, you said Lalitha. Um, am I saying that right? <laughs> um, and I said, okay, great. Now, can you tell me on the talker? You'd be like, can you write that? You'd be like, I told you. So be careful about making them do something twice. You go in, you model it and you move on. Right, that's a great point that it's important that you're going to give it back to them to do it and the parent instead models it by acknowledging their communication. 
Yeah, that's a great point to keep in mind. Okay. Um, so this one is again, um, how do we move on from words to simple sentences? Uh, so I guess this would be related to code words. So you can probably explain what are code words and why are they important? And what are the typical code words to get started with, say the first okay. five or 10 words? That's a great question as well. Um, I, as I keep getting these questions, they're you know they're really really kind of educated, wonderful, wonderful questions. So thank you for asking them. So core words. It's um, so when we look at a communication system, we want to kind of have a mix of three things. Um, we want lots and lots of core words. What are core words? Core words are the kind of the building blocks of language. They are the words that we use most often. So if you took uh, a recording of people speaking English or um, uh, Hindi or um, Spanish or Portuguese, and then you, um, you looked at all the words, about 80 to 85 percent of the words, they are the same regardless of what language you are speaking. 80 to 85 percent of all of our speech is this this group of words so there are words um a lot of pronouns i you he she it a lot of action words verbs so things like want and like and do and go and um see and think um, we use those all the time and then a lot of adjectives and a lot of function words so adjectives you know big little happy sad function words um of from to we know from um, from research that regardless of the language, there's a big set of these words called core words, and we have lists of those. Um, and I can provide some core lists um, that that you can pass along. Um, what I often start with is I often start with words that uh, are powerful, so that uh, I want the individual learning AAC to understand that language is power. Um, people with disabilities have very little control over their lives very often. Um, we have to schedule them, we have to tell them, you know, we have to do things for them. Um, there's not a whole lot of control over their environment and over other people. And people are seeking control. So one of the things that I like to start with are action words where their language can get you to do something. So playing, let's say playing a toy that, that um, you know, shoots some kind of whirly something in the air that flies around um, that if they tell you go then you make the toy go um, their language is making you do something or if they tell you go and you make a silly face as soon as they say go and then you stop and as soon as they go you make a silly face where they are making a connection that the thing that i'm telling her is making her do that um so you know um, also want, you know, that there are things that they're going to request. So uh, a lot of things to start with would be like stop, go, um, want. Different is a really important one to start with because we are always, um, with, with kids with disabilities, we tend to be just giving them choices um, and then we're frustrated. Right. They, don't, they don't select one of those choices, but how likely, if you're offering them two things, how likely is it that they necessarily want one of those two things? So if I was providing two choices, I would always have a third choice that's something different. Right. Yeah, um, that's a Yeah, so I'm not sure if, what was the other, did I answer all parts to that question? Uh, for following up with this, uh, what are the other code words that you would look at the next? I, I mean, so I guess want, stop, go. One stop, go, more, different, um, maybe like. Um, I'm trying, like I'm blanking on the, uh, yeah, there's, I will, I will provide a list that you can um, forward. Um, there's lots of core word lists and it, it's not, you know, th there can be some differences in, in what you choose, but there are some um, really helpful resources from Gail Van Tatenhove, who is a yeah. clinician, um, who's kind of the, the mother of the core vocabulary. Um, and just to, what's really important about core is that those are the words that we need to be able to produce novel ideas, new, you know, that we can say whatever we want when we want to say it, to whom we want to say it. And that's from a, 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 someone named Gail Porter. 
I believe is the original originator of that, that expression. Um, we want them to be able to say whatever they want. And if we only have like important nouns to that student, or if we only have um, full sentences, then they cannot come up with a, a, novel, a novel communication, something um, new and something specific. So we are looking for them to be able to put together language with those building blocks. But we also do want the, the fringe, which is that they're very specific words like chip or um, toy or, um, uh-oh. Ice cream. Okay, this is bad. It's not letting me, my computer may restart. I hope not. So we're gonna cross our fingers. Um, they, my, my organization is pushing out uh, some kind of software. Um, it's forcing the computers to restart. So I'm hoping that I can hold this off. <laughs> um, it says four hours until it restarts automatically. So I'm gonna cross my fingers that it doesn't restart while we're talking. Um, <laughs> Okay. Sorry, I got distracted there. Um, so we want, um, and, and we actually do want to have some full sentences, very, very few, but the kinds of things we might have phrases and sentences are quick social communication because communication partners don't always wait um, and emergency kinds of things. Right. So, you know, I'm going to have a seizure or, um, you know, I have to go to the bathroom. We want those put in as, as full thoughts so that the, you know, that time is important and they get out quickly. Right. So in fact, in ours, we do have the quick folder where you have all these ready to use phrases, which need to be communicated at once. Uh, like I want to go to the bathroom or I want to call the doctor and stuff like that. Yeah, and of course, you know, all of this is customizable. So there may be things that are very specific to your child that need to be added into that, that quick folder. Absolutely. Okay, um, great. So th that, was, that was really useful, uh, Lauren. Uh, how to make novel utterances for the child so that he's able to put together words to speak exactly what he wants to, wants to speak. Because uh, th there are people who wonder why is it that it's not good enough You just froze. I think your connection just, um, All right, are you back? I don't have your audio yet. Yeah, so so we don't, okay, let, let me turn off my, are you able to hear me? Now I can, yes. Are you able to hear me? Okay, yeah, so so you're never giving the child the, the communication autonomy that he deserves that uh, to help him say whatever he wants to say rather than being forced to say something that he may not really want to say. So right. for that purpose, uh, you, don't, you don't provide ready to use phrases or sentences. Right. Yeah, I mean, picture. So the, the other really, really important thing to mention is that often, you know, parents absolutely understand their kids better than someone who is unfamiliar, for sure. Um, but I will hear parents say, um, well, I understand everything he's saying. And if you have a child who is either nonverbal or um, has some some verbal language, but it's not easy to understand, or just has kind of minimal language, um, I would have to bet that um, that as parents, I mean, you absolutely understand more than other people, um, but I don't think as parents, um, we could ever um, truly predict everything that our child is thinking. And that seems to be a misconception. Oh, you know, I know what my child is saying, I understand. And you may understand yeah. better, um, but I think it's really important that um, we're, we're not in their head and we, we actually, even if we know them really well, there's no way we can always predict what it is that they're, they're thinking and need to express. So that's why it's so important to provide AAC and teach how to use it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We hear that a lot of times that. Uh, uh, yeah, it's really common. And I'm a parent. I get it. You know, I know my, I know my daughters, you know, better than anyone. Um, but I don't think I could ever 
say that I could predict what they were thinking. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, the next one is, um, how would you suggest to teach the concept of emotions? I mean, this may be more autism related, but how do you encourage the child to express his emotions? Okay. If you can give some examples. Yes. Um, so, you know, what I talked about a little earlier was something called attributing meaning. Um, so mm -hmm. you attribute meaning with language to something. So what I would suggest for emotions is, so if your child is sitting there and they have a very pouty face and a frown, you might say, oh no, um, I'm looking at your face and you... Yeah. You are frowning. You're frowning. I think maybe let's go to our describing words. I think maybe because you look, you look like you're frowning. Maybe you are sad. sad. You look, you look kind of sad. sad. And then you'd be like, oh, well, I'm sorry if you're sad. sad. What I'm doing is I'm not just modeling it once. I'm actually going in and I'm modeling it as many times as I can in that instance. So right there, I said the word sad three times um, and I, you know, I attached it. So what you can do is attribute meaning not only to what you see on their face or um, it could be on what's on your face. You, you know, they, let's say they did some kind of behavior that you really didn't like. You could be like, oh no, um, I feel, you know what? Sad. I feel sad because, uh, because that hurt. That makes me sad. That makes me sad. To my face when I'm sad, I'm sad. Um, or you can use pictures in books. So you could be reading a book with the child and look at the character. Oh no, look at, look at Johnny in the book. He looks like he is, mad. he looks like he is mad. You see that mad face, mm, mad, mad. And then you could be like, oh, I have a question. I have a question. Let's see, question. question. I wonder, I wonder. Where's the word why? I wonder why? why is he mad? Because you look at his face. We're going to describe him. He looks mad. mad. So regardless of whether it's um, your own child's face that you're going to attribute meaning to, if they're, if they're jumping up and down, you know, let's say that they, um, they're on the spectrum and they're super excited and they're kind of flappy, you could be like, oh, I can see. You know what? I'm going to describe something. I'm gonna to go to describe. I can see that you look super happy. You look happy, maybe because we're doing your favorite thing. Um, so the other thing that I do when I'm using the device, the most important thing to do is model. It doesn't really matter exactly what you're modeling and what you're saying. You just wanna teach language. So I often glance at the screen and whatever I meant to model, I look around on the screen and see if there's anything else on that screen that maybe I can use. I, I was going on there because um, of happy, but then when I glanced at the screen as I was modeling that for you, I happened to notice favorite. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna do that too. That's my favorite. So you want it, you, and you will get better at this. You wanna be just looking at the screen and if you need to just make stuff up. <laughs> um, it doesn't really matter what you're saying. Just use those words and you know, you're using aided language modeling, which means you are talking and then some of the words you're saying you are pairing with an activation on the screen, touching the right. screen. Great, thank you. That was wonderful input. Um, okay, here's a question uh, and I guess we should be wrapping up soon. Uh, is there, this is for me today, is there a recommended duration of modeling per week? How long should we interact with the child? Oh, wow. Um, as much as humanly possible. As much as human, there, there is not an amount. Um, there, is, um, there is a quote, uh, there's a woman named Jane Corston, um, and there was a quote a number of years ago, maybe, uh, maybe 2011 or something, I forget when it happened, talking about the amount of modeling, um, mm -hmm. By, a by the time the child is 18 months old, a child receives almost 5,000 hours. I believe, mm -hmm. I think it was, it's, it's thousands of hours 
um, of modeling but by the time they're 18 up 18 months yet in that period of time nobody is expecting them to say anything um that right. if we if we wanted to get to that same number of hours of modeling using aac um, and we only did it in speech therapy twice a week for 30 minutes they'd be 84 years old by the time they received the same amount of modeling so in short the answer is you cannot model too much. It will never be as much as you would with natural speech because it's just not possible, but to just do right. it as much as humanly possible. Um, and that can be on the device, but it can also, um, you know, you can print screens. Um, so, you know, you may want on your refrigerator to have the, the main screen with the core words um, and also have the, um, the snack screen and maybe the, uh, you know, the dinner screen actually printed um, because i think you you know that as much as you want unless your child is wearing a harness with a device and that is a really good option for some kids um is actually a harness where they they have a strap and then it, the, the device actually clips to the harness and sort of hangs against their chest and then they can just pick it up and use it i do recommend them um for some kids because then it's always there um but because if you're not wearing a harness there's going to be times when you have to communicate and your device is in the other room. So if you can even have a paper copy that, you know, if it's on the fridge and you could, you could, the child is dragging you to the refrigerator and you, when you get to the refrigerator, the device is not around. So then all you have to do is, oh, you took me by the arm. You brought me here. I think maybe you're telling me I want chips and you just are pointing the paper uh, on the, um, on the refrigerator. Um, I think that's probably my, you know, best answer to that. Just as much as you possibly, possibly can. Um, you're not going to do too much, but we're also never going to equal the amount of natural speech models. So keep going, keep modeling. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear you, uh, Laura. The connectivity is on my end. Yeah, your your sound is breaking up a bit. Are you able to? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, I am now. Uh, no, now I can't. I can see that you're talking but I can't hear you. I know the connection is, isn't your standard. Um, why you? All right, I think you're back. Uh, now I can. Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm sorry about okay. that. That's okay. Okay, I, I, do we have time for another one? We are already running out of time. Um, yeah. I guess sure. that's yeah, we can do one more. That's fine. Okay, so I'll do the, we'll do this quick one. Um, so this is from Vidya Madhalai, which I wanted to ask you earlier. Um, so she says that um, need based communication of expressing two words when children are able to speak two words, uh, then they move out of AAC. They feel that they don't require AAC, but then at times when they're actually getting into a meltdown, how do you get them back into an AAC? Yeah, so um, this is actually something I present about. And this is the, um, there is a, a big misconception that um, when kids begin to talk and begin to use verbal speech, that we can, um, in many cases, that we can just completely phase out AAC. And what I learned by, um, I met a few uh, young women with autism, um, or they refer to themselves as autistic. Um, and these young women were both in their 20s. They both have exceptionally good natural speech. So if you, you know, met them at a good moment and they were doing okay and everything was good, you perhaps wouldn't necessarily even know um, uh, that there was a language problem, their articulation is perfect. But what both of these young women taught me was that when um, a number of things happen, that they actually cannot access the speech that they would use at another time. So they may have the ability to 
you know, give me a 10 word sentence when, when things are good, when they're feeling good and, and uh, they're, they're have, you know, their sensory needs met and all of these things that they could, you know, give me a very complex, but completely understandable 10 word sentence. Yet if they are in pain, wow. if they have sensory overload, mm -hmm. if they do not have enough sensory input, all of those, all pain, anything, um, they can no longer access their natural speech. And when they can't, that's when the behaviors ensue. That's when the behaviors happen because, I, and, but what happens is the people around them, they know they can talk and they just say, oh, well, she can talk, she can do it. I've seen her say this, but it doesn't mean they can access it in that moment. So my recommendation is when you have a child, um, particularly on the spectrum, but, but you know, other kids as well, um, be really careful of, about phasing out AAC um, because it may be that it is still needed as a secondary method of communication when any number of factors um, can interfere with someone's ability to use their, their natural speech. I wrote an article about this specifically, um, and I'll be happy to share that. Right. Oh, that's a very important part because, yeah, a lot of children... Uh, who start developing speech, yeah, they get, they start phasing out AAC, thinking that speech is developing. But yeah, so this is really important for uh, for all of us to keep this in mind. Yeah, and also- Great. so I think we will conclude yeah. today's session. Yep. Um, any other questions, we will take it up next time. So thank you so much, Lauren, for joining us. And uh, yes. for the rest of the parents, hold on, we'll uh, continue with some of the questions that I can handle uh, related to ours. Thank you, uh, Lauren, once again, and I'll see you back next week. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Come in. Is there any email ID for correspondence? Yes. This is uh, support 